Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for worshiping with us here at St. Martin in the Fields. If it's your first time with us, I invite you. There's a welcome card in the pew back in front of you. Take that, jot down your name and some contact information. We'd love to get in touch with you and share a little bit more about our community here. You can place that in the offering basket later in the service, or you can hand it to me outside after the service. A couple things. I'm sure many of you are here to help us send Reverend Paula off with our prayers and our blessings. And so following this service, we'll gather over in the parish hall for a reception to celebrate her. Normally, we have service Sunday on the second Sunday. That would have been today, but it got the boot. And so next Saturday at 1 o'clock, we'll gather in the parish hall and we'll make lunches, about 140 lunches we make every month for our brothers and sisters experiencing homelessness um, through Union Gospel Mission. Another thing, if you've been following along on our journey of reunification with the Diocese of Texas, kind of the second to last step um, went through yesterday. So general convention where several hundred folks from every single diocese, all the bishops get together every three years in the Episcopal Church. It's happening right now in Baltimore. And so yesterday, the House of Deputies, which is kind of like the House of Representatives, we have two, bicameral is the word, the House of Deputies unanimously voted with a standing ovation yesterday to approve the resolution for our diocese, the Episcopal Church in North Texas, to reunify with the Diocese of Texas. So tomorrow, the House of Bishops, now we can't always trust bishops, so we never know what's going to happen, <laughs> but I have it on, they're all in Baltimore, no one's watching, so I can say what I want, have it on good authority that it will like what likely be met with the same celebration. And so when that happens tomorrow, the Episcopal Church in North Texas will cease to exist. We will be a part of the Diocese of Texas. So if you haven't been here in the last several weeks, we're filling out our application to become a parish in the Diocese of Texas. It's just a formality. There's an application in the back, a sheet of paper with a bunch of signatures. If you haven't yet already signed that, I invite you to add your name to that list so when we ship that off to the diocese down in Houston, they can see the love and support they get from this place here. So I encourage you to do that after the service. I think that's enough for what's coming up. As we prepare to worship, I invite us to take a few moments and center our hearts. Now please stand as you are able as together we sing our opening hymn, When Christ Was Lifted from the Earth.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our lessons. A reading from the prophet Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel. 
and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 82. We will read in unison. God takes his stand in the council of heaven. He gives judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, or you shall take all nations for your own. A reading from the letter to the Galatians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of the robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan was traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarius, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. I can be seated. This Sunday, we're actually all going to stay in here together for Reverend Paula's last sermon, so there won't be Children's Chapel this week. In the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, one God. Amen. Throw the ball, God. Throw the ball. In the summer of 2015, I began a three-year seminary program. There's a definite rhythm in seminary life. Class, chapel, class, chapel, lunch, class, and chapel. Evenings, you know, they leave those open for reading and writing papers. But when those three years were coming to an end, I was beginning to wonder how I would ever maintain a rhythm in my daily life without all the rigor of seminary. So I went looking for a very special dog, a Vizsla. They're hard to find, especially Vigilas that have hunters and their lineage. And I finally found a breeder in the panhandle of Oklahoma. I described my lifestyle and she agreed. A Vizsla was a good fit. And she had a litter due in April of 2018. Both the sire and the mother were hunting champions. The litter had several male pups. By the fourth week, their personalities were beginning to emerge. The breeder named the one I chose Rascal, because in her words, he got into absolutely everything. In his fifth week, she sent a photo. <laughs> Based on her description of his personality, I named him for an island off the coast of Ireland, Dursey. Of all the places I have hiked in this world, Dursey Island is the most memorable mix of wildness, winds that threaten to hurl you into the Atlantic Ocean, and unspoiled beauty. In his seventh week, 
the breeder placed him into my arms and said, good luck with that one. <laughs> Seminarians learn many things, but first and foremost, we learn to think theologically. Or said differently, we learn to interpret our world through our growing understanding and awareness of God. On the very first night with Dursey, I stayed in a hotel. There was a full-length mirror in that room. The seven-week-old puppy stared at his image in the mirror. He sniffed the mirror, licked it, touched it with his paw, and then he barked at it. I've been around a lot of seven-week-old human babies, and I've never seen one that understood how to use its physical innate gifts at that age to interpret the world. But a dog lives a much shorter lifespan than a human, and Dursey is a living microcosm of a human life. And so I began paying very close attention to him, theological attention. At seven weeks old, he understood his nose, his eyes, his tongue, his voice. And he was able to experience new things through these filters built into his extraordinary being. By the end of week seven, he knew three human words, sit, potty, and walk. All of this learning required many naps. As week eight came to an end, it was time for him to learn to be in a kennel and alone for 45 minutes a day. The kennel was perfectly sized for the puppy. He had a cushioned sleeping area, brand new water and food bowls, a toy, and a chew stick. All of his needs were met, and each time he went into the kennel, I would leave him with the same words, I love you, Darcy, I'll be back. The first day I left him in the kennel, I went to the grocery store and returned 45 minutes later. My neighbors were in the driveway. <laughs> they had been inside their homes, listening to my dog inside my home, howl, yelp, and bark for 45 minutes. And I persisted. Every day I would leave him in the kennel. Each week I increased our separation time by 15 minutes. During the first few weeks, each time I would come home and open the kennel, he would just pour himself into my arms. He whimpered as if he was saying, please don't leave, please don't go. But during the fourth week of kennel training, a new thing happened. One day I came home, opened the kennel, and Dursey leapt into my arms. He began licking my chin, his tail was wagging a thousand miles per hour and he ran to the front door to ring the bells that tell me he needs to go out. I let him out, and he ran to the flower pot where I keep a tennis ball for playtime. He brought that ball to me, dropped it at my feet, and began his dirty dance. Throw the ball, Mom! Throw the ball! <laughs> and of course I threw the ball. From that day to this day, that is the greeting I experience every time we've been separated. In week four of kennel training, our relationship matured. Dursey demonstrated trust. The dog could not possibly know where I went, how long I would be gone, whether I would be detained, or on and on. But in that fourth week, trust moved him from being fearfully alone to being joyful in our reunion. It was a remarkable moment and shift in our relationship. At 10 months old, one February morning, Dursey climbed into the back seat of my car at 6 a.m. When we arrived in Colorado 12 hours later, he had a brand new experience. <laughs> Six feet of snow. I remember at the time reflecting on this moment the dog had never seen snow, never felt snow on his paws. The door opened and he was immersed in a winter wonderland and he just embraced it. He ran and ran and ran. This would be the last trip where he would experience Colorado on a leash. Dursey was growing and so was I. At 14 months old, Dursey and I spent the whole month of June hiking in the wilderness. 
he, when we began that month, was about 50-50 on his recall command. Half the time I call him and he would come and half the time he would look and go back to what he was doing. But he was often playing with my neighbor's dog, Eva, and she was 100% on her recall command. So if Dursey was ignoring me, I'd call the neighbor's dog and he would follow her back to me. I really wanted to hike off leash with Dursey. It's safer for us. But that 50-50 recall command left me nervous. So I asked my neighbor, Annie, how in the world did you teach Eva to do this? And she said, why don't we take the dogs out together and we'll let Eva show Dursey how it's done. Well, the first day we took a fairly short hike, about three miles, and it seemed to me the dogs were running wild. But every now and then I noticed that Eva would come up alongside Annie. Annie would reach down, pet her on the head and say, good check-in, Eva. Dursey was modeling everything Eva did, so he would come alongside me, I'd pet him on the head, say good dog, good check-in, and then I would give him bacon to cement the deal. On the second morning, we went on a longer and much more challenging hike. Near the end, the dogs were out in front of us again on the trail and way out of our sight, and Annie said, Paula, this is the time. We need to get off the trail and sit on a log and wait to see how long it will take the dogs to come and find us. Well, my heart was pounding. I was certain Dursey was in New Mexico by now, <laughs> and I would never see him again. But Annie explained what we were doing. Paula, you and Dursey have a very strong bond. He's not going anywhere. Eventually, he will realize that his silly human has managed to get lost and then he's going to come find you every time. Well, a good five to 10 minutes went by, and then I heard the sound of a stampede headed toward me. You see, Vizslas are the third fastest breed among dogs on planet Earth. Dursey and his breed are able to run over 40 miles per hour. And he was running so hard and so focused that he ran right by us. <laughs> Eva the little, is a little German shepherd. She's not built to run that fast, but she was determined not to lose sight of Dursey. But she was so focused on him that she ran by us too. After a few minutes by, went by, things got really quiet. The dogs had lost us. And then I began to hear Dursey whimper. I whistled one time and he came running through the underbrush. The next day, Dursey and I hiked alone. Halfway through the hike, he was out in front of me, out of my line of sight. And so I turned my phone on to video and ducked behind a big tree. I wanted to video and know how long will it take him to realize I'm missing and come and find me. 22 seconds. <laughs> At first, I thought Eva had done this great teaching of Dursey. But then I realized it was really Annie who taught me how to be in relationship with a dog. Dursey is a bird dog. He wasn't created to be at the end of a leash. He was created to chase birds and squirrels and everything else that moves. But until I was willing to risk letting go, Dursey's experience was always contained by the length of my leash. I had to I had kind of inserted myself as the epicenter of his life. Once I let go of my fears, Dursey's nature was his guide. In Christian ethics, the change happening in Dursey is described as flourishing. Dursey, living into the fullness of being the very dog God created Dursey to be, that is flourishing. Two years into our relationship, my exercise journal hit pause. While playing backyard soccer with a friend, my ankle broke. Bishop Mayer ordained me while I was still in a cast, and on July 1st, 2020, St. Martin's took on a new curate. The world had a big closed sign in its window, but St. Martin's was determined to flip that sign around. 
we began a Zoom-based curriculum called Human Flourishing. And as we built trust in one another, we began to flourish in new ways, as individuals, as a group, even as a parish. Spring of 2021, after some discernment, I decided to sell my home. It was the only home Dursey knew. I've often wondered what that time was like for him. After all of our stuff had been moved from the old house to the new house, we went back to the old house to make sure nothing had been overlooked. We walked into an empty house and Dursey looked at me for a long moment. And then he went back to the car, got in it and stayed. This was not home anymore. Within a very short time, he trained our new neighbors to carry dog treats and to be properly loved and rewarded each and every morning by a Dursey greeting. He knit a community for us in this new place where he was planted. The where and the what do not matter to him. As long as we are together, we are home. And when we aren't together, well, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> Some of you will remember sermons that grew from each of these Dursey vignettes. Seeing God's handiwork in Dursey and through the way he embraces life has been fun. But his life is also a sign, a sign that sheds light on our own human journey with God. Our relationship with God deepens with trust, or to use a theological word, faith. St. Martin's has traveled together through a pandemic. The stock markets are a little bit rattled. Inflation is growing and violence is a daily occurrence. The world in which we live is broken, and it always has been. Intentionally looking for signs of God's love in this world is a life-giving skill. By God's grace, we have the gift of faith to see God in a creature like Dursey, in nature, and in other human beings. Loving our neighbor isn't just an exercise of semantics, as the lawyer in the gospel suggests. Who exactly is my neighbor? Our neighbors are the ones we like, the ones we abhor, and the vast majority who fall between those extremes. Human flourishing invited us to grow empathy for all people, to imagine the socio-cultural obstacles that prevent our neighbor from living into the fullness of the person God created them to be. There is risk in loving. Jesus did not say it would be easy. On his fourth birthday this year, Dursey hiked in the San Juan National Forest. No leash. He cleared the trail in front of me. He scouted the trail behind me, finding people on the trail I did not know were there. Here he is looking across the tall grasses, scanning for deer and small game. This is who Dursey was created to be, a focused hunting dog, at home in the wilderness, guarding his human partner. He is a confident hiker and I am confident in our partnership. And I wonder, I wonder if God longs for this kind of relationship with you, that you might not live fearfully, but patiently and faithfully seeking God, to live with the joy that screams, throw the ball, God, throw the ball to live into the fullness of God's image planted already within you. Amen. Standing as you are able, let us together affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of Uganda. In our Diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Albine's Episcopal Church in Arlington. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. In our school cycle of prayer, we pray for the students, teachers, and staff a Chisholm Trail Intermediate, Colleyville ISD, and Creighton University. Lord, in your mercy, your comfort and heal all those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially Sean, John, Rick, Mary Jane, Kathy, Suzette, Richard, Judy, Terry, Patty, Louise, Wayne, Millie, Ken, Richard, Doug, Larry, Ramona, Nancy, Charlie, Carrie, Shauna, Alice, Barbara, Helen, Sylvia. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to, all your, we commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be full, fulfilled, and we pray that they may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Our prayer. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion on us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sins against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Welcome again. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Just a reminder, the celebration continues following the service. We'll head over to the parish hall for a reception and honor and thanksgiving for Paula and her life and work among us. This is the point in our service where we love to pray for folks celebrating milestones in their lives. Is there anyone with us today celebrating a birthday? I don't see anybody, no. (laughs) Birthday there, awesome, Carrie. Happy birthday. Anyone else? Right, for Carrie and for anyone who might be worshiping with us online, let us pray. Oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anyone with us today celebrating an anniversary? Awesome. How many years? 21. Wow. Yeah, you can go stand. I don't know. He may put you to work if you stand back there. He'll be running a camera pretty soon. Let us pray. O God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Happy anniversary, y'all. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, Holy Eucharist, communion, it goes by many different names, but the one thing you need to know is that everyone is welcome at God's table in this place. That includes folks who may be worshiping with us online. If you're online and aren't able to make it here, there's a link um, on the video where you can sign up to have a lay Eucharistic visitor come and visit you. John and his team will set up someone to come and visit you and bring you the Eucharist. And for any of you in here, if there's someone in your life, or maybe you at some point aren't able to make it here regularly, I invite you to reach out to us. We would love to extend God's table into your home through our lay Eucharistic visitor program. For those of us in the room, when the usher tells you it's your time to come forward, we make our way around the rail. We start on the outside and work in toward the middle. When you get to your place, you can stand or kneel, whatever is your preference. And then when we come by with the bread and the wine, um, with the bread, you can receive that by placing one open palm on top of the other, and we'll place that bread in your hand. Coming behind will be the chalice bearers, and when they present the chalice to you, you can either dip and tink the corner of the wafer in that, or you can sip from the chalice, whichever you prefer. If it's not your custom to receive the Eucharist, I still invite you to come forward. You can cross your arms, and that will be a signal for us to to pray a blessing over you. We also offer prayers of healing and anointing at this time. If you desire those prayers, before you make your way around the rail, I invite you, um, there will be clergy right here in the middle. Um, And So if you present yourself to that clergy, they can anoint you and pray God's healing power over you, and then you can make your way to receive the Eucharist, and then back to your seats. Right now, we're about to pass the offering plates 
to one another. And as we do so every week, I invite you to use this as an opportunity to hold these plates in your hand for a moment, say a brief prayer, and ask God how you might give your life in his service this week. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please stand as you are able for our prayer after communion. Together, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. When you're the rector, there are certain times that you get to take privilege. Paula will learn this in a couple weeks. So Paula, I'm going to invite you to come out here with me. She didn't know this was coming. Come on. We're testing your recall. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh, holy God, you raise up laborers for your harvest, sending them out as sowers of your gospel and caretakers of new life. We give thanks for Paula and the many roles she has played here at St. Martin's, from parishioner to vestry to treasurer to Stephen ministry and everything else, to seminarian, finally to priest. And now we send her out into the world to love and serve your people at St. Christopher's. Bless your servant in her work tending your church. Equip her for service, enliven her with your joy, and help her remember and trust that it is you who will bring in the harvest, through Jesus Christ, the Savior of souls. Amen. Amen. Will you bless us all? Oh, yeah. Thank you. blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let's go forth in the name of Christ.